Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Train Talk podcast. I'm Monty Miller. I'm Rebecca Cowell. And we are part of the Texas Central team that's building your Texas high-speed train. In case you don't know about the Texas high-speed train project, we are building a Shinkansen train that's going to go between North Texas and Houston in 90 minutes with one stop in the Brazos Valley. That stop will serve College Station, Huntsville, and the surrounding communities. And for those of you watching this podcast that, that are unaware with Central Texas geography, uh, the Brazos Valley area is home to uh, Sam Houston State, Blinn, and my alma mater, Texas A&M University. Woo. Uh, so, but this project isn't going to only impact and benefit the people along that corridor. It's really going to benefit the entire state of Texas. This is the t first true high-speed train project of its kind in the entire country and being done entirely from an uh, investor-led perspective. Yeah, so what we want to do with this podcast is just bring you along with us on this journey to build your Texas train. There's only one place in the world that I think we should start with, uh, with this podcast, Rebecca, and that's with the most knowledgeable person on earth when it comes to bringing Shinkansen trains to another country and another city. And that man is Paul Wavy. Tell us about Paul Wavy, Rebecca. So Paul Wavy actually was the person who was in charge of bringing the Shinkansen technology out of Japan for the first time and into the Taiwanese market and managed the entire construction and delivery of that system. So Rebecca, if you could pick one person in the entire world to, to work in this position, who would you pick? Oh, it would be Mr. Paul Wavy. Well, let's go talk to him. Hi, Paul. Hi. Thanks for having me. Thank you oh, for welcome. being here. So I just wanted to start off, uh, tell us a little bit about high-speed train projects that you've been involved with in the past. So I worked on, uh, a I've worked on a couple of high-speed projects. The, the one that's most similar to Texas is the Taiwan high-speed rail project. We started in 2002 and we ran till 2007. Um, we, I went back last year for a 10-year celebration of safe operation. Um, broadly, very similar to Texas and very similar to Japan. It's the same system that we use? Same, same system, same 700 series train, slightly different for Taiwan, as ours will be slightly different for Texas. Mm -hmm. But the underlying control systems, the, the method of build and how we keep passengers safe, everything like that is the same. That's the Shinkansen system? It's a Shinkansen system how train. How has yeah. that uh, system been um, around? It's been operational since January the 1st, 2007. So they've been operating a little bit over 11 years now. That's for the Taiwanese system? The Taiwanese yeah. system, yeah. Okay. And I've also worked on um, some of the UK high-speed rail, both the specification and the development, and that's still in progress at the moment. So you had mentioned some of the smart systems that are involved with the Shinkansen system that keep the system operating so impeccably. Can you talk to us about some of those? Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, especially in the US, because the technology we're using here is somewhat different from what you would might expect on a standard US type system. I mean, for me, the major difference is that a Shinkansen system continuously checks the status of the train, all the trains in the system, passengers in stations and other systems, and it makes this continuous decision to keep operating. And if there is a problem, whether there's a problem with the track or there's a problem with the infrastructure or there's a problem with another train, then the system has to stop and trains have to stop. I mean, that's the key difference. Operating a high-speed train is much more like a flight. You, you, you don't have moments to stop the train. It takes five, six kilometers or two, three miles to stop the train. So we have to treat it like a, a kind of redundant air system which requires continuous monitoring of all of the facility and the trains to keep things running. Now, it's the, the train's got a uh, reputation for being really punctual. So how does that, so does this just not happen very often to where there's a there's a occurrence so, that makes the train have to stop? Yeah, so punctuality starts with reliability. Sure. So the train and all the associated systems, the power systems, the control systems, the signaling systems have to be reliable. And that reliability in a Japanese system comes from redundancy and duplication. So, for example, if we were to lose one of the safe systems on the train, there's another safe system that runs in concurrency with the operating system that immediately takes over. So in some systems, you hear about hot standby and cold standby, and our system operates in a hot standby configuration. In a cold standby configuration, the train would have to stop, somebody would have to switch on the other system, the train would have to restart, and you would lose some minutes, some passenger mm -hmm. minutes. But in a hot standby system, 
it immediately takes over. And that's the same for the systems on the train, for the systems on the wayside, for the systems in the control room, even for the power system. So we can lose about 50% of all systems, and it will be completely seamless. The passengers won't know, even the operators won't necessarily know, we'll just continue operation. And the level of safety, even if you lose 50%, is exactly the same. So wow. it allows you to get, get trains back to the depot to maintain them, to bring all the systems back online, or to spend some time in the evening bringing the wayside systems back up and keeping them in operation. That's one of the big differences between a Japanese system and a European system. Um, it does take longer to test, and it does cost a little bit more to install like that, but the Japanese work on the principle that punctuality is key to maintain ridership, to keep people interested, so that people can rely on their journey. So we've, we've taken that principle and imported it into Texas, which is important. People, if you're gonna build the high-speed rail system in America, the first real proper high-speed system, you wanna build the best one you can build. Absolutely. And that's, that's what we're trying to do. Amazing, Great. so you talked a little bit about some of the operational systems involved yeah. with running a train like this to keep it so safe. Yeah. What, what kind of operational system do the Shinkansen trains make use of? So the key safety operational system is the signaling system. And the signaling system decides for every journey when the train can start and if it's safe to start. So that signaling system looks at the status of all the trains on the system, so for example, let's say you've got a train that's left Dallas, before the next train to depart can depart, that first train needs to be a certain distance away, and it needs to stay a certain distance away. So the signaling system in real time keeps track of that train, sends that information to the rear train, and continuously as those two trains move along the right of way together, they maintain a safe distance. And if at any time this first train was to stop or slow down, then this train would have to stop and slow down as well. So I think, think about it like an intelligent cruise control system in a car, okay. that both vehicles are reliant on each other to maintain their safe position for them to be continued to run. And the, and the difference is, in a cruise control system on a car and a train, is that we are using multiple systems to check that spacing. So if one of those systems was to fail, the other system immediately kicks in. In the 54 or so years that Shinkansen's been operating that principle, they've never come close to a collision. Wow. Ever. That's incredible. So that's the way we have to look at it. Wow, and so that, and so that means that trains are never going in opposite directions at one time? Like no trains are can, can, going no. north and so south? So like... we're, we're not designing this system to allow trains to face each other and run together. When we're worried about collisions on our system, we're really worried about rear collisions okay. where one train in front could stop and the other train could hit it. So there's two dedicated tracks? There are tracks. two dedicated tracks, one for southbound, one for northbound. Of course, we have the capability to cross over those tracks. Mm -hmm. At stations, we may want to send a train into another platform if there's some kind of problem in the other platform. And in emergency conditions, we will or we can operate on the wrong track. But once we get to that, and that would require a significant number of problems to have occurred, okay. um, we'd be operating at slow speed. So okay. there is a fallback to use the wrong track, but it would be very unlikely to be used. So if we, if we consider the Taiwan situation, for example, where they've got a very similar configuration to us, I think in the 10 years of operation, they've only used it once, maybe twice. And again, it's at very slow speed. And you would only really use it if you wanted to get passengers into a station to get them off the train and safe. You wouldn't use it to continue normal operation. Okay. Yeah. So it's the, there are lots of degraded modes that we use to go from normal operation to completely stopping the railway. Mm -hmm. That's called graceful degradation. But as we come down that sort of degraded mode set of uh, incidents, the speed of the train slow down to match the level of safety that we're trying to achieve. Wow, so here in the United States, we hear a whole bunch of talk in train world about PTC, positive train control. Yes. Um, I know that the Shinkansen system utilizes something called ATC, automatic yes. train control. Can you describe to us what the difference between those two operational <laughs> yeah. systems is? So positive train control is a, is a bigger, more encompassing word for a number of systems that have different levels of safety. 
So on an existing railway in the US, we, we, many of these lines now are trying to put PTC on, on those lines to help improve their uh, method of operation. And they're often overlay systems. So they may, for example, control trains to a stop at a red signal. So if a train passes a red signal, it may be forced to automatically stop. In an ATC system, we, we have a more continuous integrated approach. So whilst we do have PTC, it isn't at a point in the railway or a station or a number of locations, it's just a continuous process. The train is running continuously on an ATC system which every 200 milliseconds or so is checking and checking again and checking again that all the conditions for it to maintain its speed and safety are maintained. And, and that's, the, that's the critical thing. Wow, so what would happen if one of those systems would fail? So, like I said before, if one of those systems has failed um, and gone offline, there is a, a redundant system which is automatically taking over. If one of those systems was to fail and the redundant system wasn't available, the train would just stop. So, there's a kind of window, a window around, a sort of bubble around the train, if you can imagine it, of safety. That, that bubble is extended such that if anything goes wrong, the and the train is asked to stop, that it all stops within that safety bubble. You're never going to exceed the point where the, uh, the likelihood of a collision is possible. Wow, is there anything like that in the US today? So, obviously there are systems like that in the US. Um, most of those systems are in mass transit type railways. If you think about New York subway or something like that, where you've got lots of trains, not traveling at a particularly high speed, mm -hmm. but are very bunched up close together, they use very similar systems. And so there's, there's a lot of similarity between a, a, a kind of subway system and a high speed system. It's just in a, in a high speed system, because we're going much faster, and because obviously we're carrying a lot more people, and the risks of an accident would be catastrophic, then the amount of checks that we do and the amount of redundancy that we have is increased to minimize any possibility of incident. And you know, you go back to the 54 year safe record in Japan, they haven't had that type of failure or that type of scenario. Wow. So would you call these trains safe constants? <laughs> safe constants. <sighs> I'm not quite sure that works with the Japanese, but <laughs> you, you could, you could in principle. Uh, I think the way to think about it, and, and, and not only, you know, the other big difference that I would see between a Japanese system and, and other systems is the amount of time and effort we spend verifying its safety before we let passengers on. So typically, we would we would operate the train across a section of track for about a year without passengers, starting the speed slow at say 80 kilometers an hour or 50 miles an hour, and then slowly, week on week, increasing the speed. We're looking at the vibrations on the track, we're looking at the status of the train bogies to make sure everything's fine. We're obviously looking at all the electronic systems on the train and monitoring them and the changes at different speeds and how they're working. And then once we get to three, you know, 300 kilometers an hour or 190 miles an hour approximately, we would maintain that speed in testing for several months. And, and then we would exceed that speed. So we would test up at say 200 miles an hour or 205 miles an hour um, to push the envelope of the train and its systems to make sure it still remained completely within the design limits that we'd specified. And that takes a bit of time. So you're gonna have to wait a little bit to get this perfect train but it's worth it because once you've validated it, we know it's safe. So as someone who has been to Taiwan, who were, was there for the initial development all the way through operations beginning of, yeah. of that brand new yeah. system, you know, you saw what Taiwan was like before having high speed trains introduced into that environment and what it's been like since then and after. So in your opinion, just as someone who was there seeing how, how, P commuters lived their lives before and after. What is the biggest change you think uh, that high-speed trains in Taiwan have introduced? I, I'm, I'm maybe a bit biased in this sense, but when we started to build this the system in Taiwan, obviously there was a, some public um, outcry. It's a big change for any location to build a custom-built viaduct-based line through, through your countryside and through your city. Um, and right through the design phase, 
questions, the press, the TV, the public, why are we doing this? What difference will it make? How, how, how will it, what, this is not gonna win, this is not gonna benefit me. Um, and then I think it was probably for me about a month after we'd opened to the public that, that the whole situation changed. And people realized that, that not only we were connecting major cities together, um, which w previously were a four and a half, five hour car journey or a one hour plane journey. And in Taiwan, that plane journey was across some of the worst mountains in East Asia and subject to the worst thunderstorms and other things like that. Um, that the economic benefits were, were immense. People realistically could live at one end of the island and work at the other end of the island. You could now go into one city for a meeting in the morning and leave home at seven and be in your meeting at nine and you could be home for dinner at six with your kids. That was unthought of before. Even on the air, you know, even, even using planes, weather delays would cause immense problems. And once the planes bunched up, it just became impossible. So, so from our point of view, it, it made a huge difference. And I lived in Taiwan for three further years past operations, and I would use the system regularly. I mean, and once people realize how safe and how convenient it is, and how it's a bit like getting on a subway system. You know, you're just going into a station, buying a ticket and getting on a train. Just a little faster. Just a little bit faster, yeah. Um, it stops to be that kind of planned journey that people worry about. You imagine taking four kids and, and having to get them all ready to get on a plane and make sure you've got all their IDs or passports and tickets and then get them through security and make sure they stay together. And then you've got to buy them food and feed them and get them to the toilet. Then you get on the plane and you're stuck on the taxiway for an hour. And, and, and finally you, you get to take off and then you get to your destination airport and you have to wait for your bags and one of your bags is late and the kids are whiny and tired and crying. You know, People stopped thinking about that. People just went to the station, got on the train, got off the train, and, and carried on their day. It, it made a huge change to the island.